Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, Principal Atmospheric Scientist at Nutrient Ag Solutions, and I want to thank you for watching this weekly Ag Weather Update brought to you by the Farm Credit Associations of North Carolina. Well, we're going to begin today's video by talking long term. We're going to look out at summer and look at some of the major drivers of this summer pattern. So I'm going to take you back one month ago on April 9th, and we're going to look at sea surface temperature anomalies, which means differences from normal. Now, as we think about this pattern, there were a few areas that I want to watch very carefully. One is going to be the North Pacific tucked here into the Gulf of Alaska. Two is going to be this area right over here in the Western Atlantic Gulf and in the Caribbean. And the third is going to be right in through here. And we're also going to take a look at what's going on just north of Australia as well. Now, if you just let me get those drawings off there and just take a quick mental snapshot of this, because what I'm going to do next is I'm going to show you how things changed over the last month. So ready? This was one month ago. This was over the weekend. Now you notice that in the North Pacific temperatures have warmed considerably. You can see that in the North Atlantic we have a tongue in through here where we started to see some cooler water mixing in with the Gulf Stream, but still very warm to the south of it into the Caribbean and Gulf of Mexico. Three, notice this area right in through here, finally starting to show up right in through there, especially with some cooler water that's been surfacing from below. But the Indian Ocean, very, very warm for this time of year. Now, these are going to be the four regions across the world that we're going to have to watch very carefully as our early preseason indicator of what summer might give us. OK, so let's talk about that and see what is currently going on there. Now, the graph that's over there on the left shows you something called the Southern Oscillation Index. It's an index we use to see the behavior of El Nino. And in general, if the value of the index is below minus seven, we're talking about a strong El Nino. If the value is above seven, which is off the chart, it's way up here, we're talking about a strong La Nina. Zeros right in through there. And what I want you to notice is that going back to April, we've been climbing in the value of the Southern Oscillation Index now that it's sitting just above zero. Now, what does that mean? Well, if you look over there at that figure that's on the right, see the blues? The blues, this is looking back in time from May 15th all the way back to April 10th. And you're getting a snapshot looking straight down, uh, basically east to west across the Pacific Ocean, right on the equator. And the blues indicate where the winds are stronger out of the east. We call those the trade winds. And when they're stronger out of the east, stronger than normal, that generally indicates, well, the beginnings of what could be a La Nina-like upcoming summer, especially late summer and early fall. So this is the latest data. This is what I'm getting to here. This is valid June, July, and August of this year. And if we look at those four areas, in fact, we'll just put some uh, circles from PowerPoint on them so you can see it. Those are the four areas I'm most concerned about. Notice that in the central Pacific Ocean, the stronger trade winds allowing for more upwelling, cooler water extending across this area. Now, what's critical about this is that normally, whenever we see La Nina-like conditions, we often see that the waters in through here cool off too. Now, that would be critical if we saw the models doing that, but we don't. In fact, in that area, what do we see? We see the water staying very warm in the North Pacific. Now, why this is so critical is because of where the warm water in the North Pacific, with relation to what's going on in the central equatorial Pacific, does to the jet stream. If it stays warm in the North Pacific, this is going to favor the jet stream favoring more of a ridge like this. And if it ridges over the western part of the United States and through this area, it tends to give us more broad and extending troughs across the east, just in general. Now, if that is the setup for this upcoming summer, that is something that takes off the major risk of heat stress all summer long. It puts it west. That is consistent with the warm water that you see over here. Now, as we've been talking about in the last few videos, if La Nina conditions do begin to emerge, and they slow down the wind shear within this area, we do know that the ocean temperatures are forecast to be warmer than normal, which means despite everything I just told you, we could see a very active hurricane season. So with that as a backdrop, let me show you what the latest June, July, August forecast is from the European model. Now remember, out this far, we cannot use the MJO. We can't use those other indices I'd like to talk about, like the North Atlantic Oscillation or the East Pacific Oscillation. They're all subseasonal. We can only use, looking this far out, ocean temperatures. And the model's being consistent with the warmth pushing into the North Pacific. It is favoring a jet stream pattern that maybe does something a bit more like this. And that is why you do not see right now the longer range models picking up on extreme heat. 
Now here are a few things I want to watch. We currently have droughts setting up in this part of the United States. So I'm drawing over the top of this temperature map. If we see drought extend, extending to the north and to the east by the time we get into June, if it's expanded in those directions, that will be one thing that will help push that jet stream more in a pattern like this. And the closer that ridge gets to the Great Lakes, the better the chances are of the subtropical ridge setting up right there underneath it. So we got to watch a few things here. If the ocean temperatures cool in this area, that's an indicator of watching heat developing here. If we see drought expanding in this area, that's an indicator of potential for heat expanding here as well. So right now the models are not giving us that, but we have things we need to be watching. So to stay consistent, here's what the precipitation pattern's looking for. And overall, it's keeping much of the Eastern Corn Belt, much of the Mid-Atlantic, parts of the Carolinas, getting down into the Gulf Coast, wetter than average for summer. We can see that the models are also trying to create some homebrew uh, tropical activity. That's tropical thunderstorms that develop right here along the Gulf Coast, which have the potential to become, well, more serious systems like tropical storms uh, or potentially even hurricanes. So this is what we're looking out for June, July, August. This data just became available midweek last week. I want to give you those updates, okay? From here, let's now take a look at what we got over the weekend. This is a very fast animation of what we saw over the weekend in terms of record cold. And let's just go right here to early in the morning on May the 9th, right there. So this is Saturday. We can see widespread across each part of the country, each one of those blue dots representing here, a uh, temperature that was either approaching, breaking, or setting a new all-time record low. Very cold temperatures tucked away in that uh, broad trough across each part of the United States. Now to show you how cold it did get, I made this map which looks at the number of hours spent below 32 degrees Fahrenheit, from 7 p.m. on April 7th, now that's central time, uh, to 7 p.m. on the 10th, so Mother's Day here. Now, what we did get in the Carolinas was we had some patchy frost in through this area, but in general, temperatures only got down to the low to middle 30s across the area, but some of the low-lying areas, patchy frost. For you corn and soybean farmers, look at where we hit with um, uh, not just a freeze, but a long duration freeze in parts of Iowa, Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, and Ohio. We had freezing temperatures that got all the way down into Kentucky and Tennessee as well. So this was a substantial event setting all time records for some places. Now, just to show you something kind of neat put out here by the National Weather Service at Pittsburgh. Have you often seen those signs or heard about how the bridge freezes up before the roadway does? Well, because of the airflow going over the bridge and under the bridge, it gets cool much quicker. And this is just a great image to show you what that looks like. So where the road touches the ground, it's more insulated and therefore doesn't have this effect. So I just want to show you this neat thing we saw over the weekend here. So where's this pattern going? Well, we can see that still at the beginning of this week, a deep trough out west, big ridge running up the western part of the United States, and then this deep trough here, which is going to still take a couple of days to get out of the way. Now, this trough here and this ridge are highly amplified. In fact, that ridge goes clear up into the Arctic. But this pattern is breaking down. Let me show you how things look one week from now. This is now next Monday. That trough is now sitting here. See it right there. And a broader ridge extends across much of the eastern two-thirds of the United States. This certainly means a return toward warmth. This also means a return toward big-time Gulf moisture here. But what about precipitation patterns in the Carolinas? Well, we need to talk about that. Because the European model over the next week paints this corridor in through here as being very wet. And it leaves the Carolinas off dry. We are watching the potential for some tropical development here uh, over the uh, Bahamas, but it is forecast to stay offshore. Now, we're not talking about any major tropical storm or hurricane, but I'll show you what I mean in just a few moments. What about even out into week two? Still, we do not see a lot of above average precipitation for the Carolinas as we stretch out that far. And just to show you, we do have multi-model support in this. These are now the same two maps, week one on the left, week two on the right from the GFS. Okay. So thinking about that, let's now put this into broader perspective. Over the next 15 days, which is what we're looking at, we do see drier than normal conditions in this section of the country and much wetter here. So piggybacking off of what we talked about earlier, I want to watch carefully to see how much moisture does return to this area here because it's going to be critical for North Carolina summer pattern because we've been very dry in there. See that? So if moisture returns to that area and the heat stays out west, 
and we still see those warm ocean temperatures in the North uh, uh, Pacific, that's a better indicator that this upcoming summer will not see the moisture and temperature stresses. So let's watch it very carefully. Now, one thing is for sure, the temperatures are warming. Take a look at this. Now, this is for Raleigh. What you see here in kind of these green bars is the temperature overnight, and in the blue, that's the temperature in the afternoon. So we have a cool Tuesday, Wednesday, right? Look at Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Yeah, we may see temperatures topping on the upper 80s, lower 90s as our lows finally regain back here into the 50s and 60s. But we still got another cool morning tomorrow morning to deal with here uh, with these overnight low temperatures. So the next five days, still the broad cool sector here, but it's moving. You saw it just a moment ago. That cooler air is moving to the east, such that by day five through 10, look at the warmth that's returning, especially over here to the Carolinas, where we're gonna go over into summer-like temperatures. As we look out here today, 10 through 15, it is still on as we try to finish out the month of May with above average temperatures. So the cold we're getting right now, we've seen over the last few days, it's temporary, it's on its way out, and we're going to see much above average temperatures returning. Now let's get into some of the details here. Over the next couple of days, we have uh, two regions we're going to watch pretty carefully for severe weather. We're going to start here today and then move it over there on uh, by the time we get into tomorrow on, uh, on Tuesday. But as we look out over the next week, it's really only going to be the Appalachian Mountains, I think, on their western facing slopes are going to be seeing much of any precipitation. If you watch this again, this just takes you through Monday, end of the day now on Tuesday working our way into Wednesday morning, and we still don't see much of a chance at precipitation, mainly over here at the higher elevations in the western side of the state. Uh, when we look out to Wednesday, uh, high pressure dominates. The return of moisture is here. It's up in the midsection of the United States, so, so the windy conditions are as the air flows clockwise around that high. And at that time period, that's where the severe weather is. Now, this is a nice break over what we've seen so far this year with much above average severe weather across the Carolinas. So as you go out through the next week, this is the European model, operational European model. And look at that donut hole right there. There's a chance that outside of the, the mountains in the west uh, of North Carolina here, we won't see much precipitation at all as our temperatures really start to rebound. So when is there a chance? Well, we can play the European model, but you've seen so far through Wednesday morning, Let's just work our way through Thursday. High pressure dominates. Temperatures really rebound here Thursday into Friday. And all the action runs around the periphery of that high. See it there? And therefore, we stay with southerly winds and warm temperatures. Maybe pop up scattered showers. But other than that, it's going to be dry through Friday night into Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon and evening. Here's the little tropical system we were thinking about watching develop. But it's going to stay, as you can see here, offshore. And maybe next, I don't know, Monday afternoon, we could get some storms that come through this area. But overall, this is on the drier side of things. Now, just to let you know, the ensemble models are picking up on possibly watching the track of that low. But this is not going to be any major tropical system that's coming out of the Bahamas here. So we're just going to keep a close eye on that just because we know how warm those ocean temperatures are. So again, just to remind you, I have week two from the GFS, week two from the European over here, and both of them continue to keep things near average to drier than average as we work our way out here almost to the end of the month of May. When it comes to temperatures, like we said, we're still dealing with some cooler weather. We see temperatures this morning into the mid 40s here, but as we play this forward, we can see there's our cool morning on Tuesday, but the rebound happens by Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And then we are back up with our overnight lows sitting in the low 60s. Watch temperatures on the high side of things. So here's high temperatures. So cool days today and tomorrow. But then watch here is Wednesday, mid to upper 60s. Thursdays, almost up to 80. Now we're back into Friday, Saturday, Sunday. That's where there's upper 80 start to regain control here uh, across uh, parts of the Carolinas. So just to review it again, here's what day five through 10 looks like. That gets you out to the 21st of May. And this goes all the way out to the 26th. And we still see the warmer than average conditions hanging on here across uh, the eastern part of the United States. 
To finish this up, real quick, I want to talk to you about what's going on in Europe. I'm just going to color in for you where the Black Sea is. So it's right in through here on this image, and on this image, it's right in there. So there's been some news lately about the drier conditions that have been in parts of southeastern Ukraine getting over into the Russian wheat belt. And we see that over the next week or so, the heaviest precipitation misses that same area again. Uh, so we're concerned about some drought issues developing here. And meanwhile, the rest of Ukraine over the next week ba barely picks up between a third and three quarters of an inch of rainfall total. And that happens as much cooler than average weather comes into this area once we get to the middle and end of this week and start next week. So we'll watch that carefully throughout the rest of this growing season as it tends to have an impact on our markets. Finally, just want to finish up with South America. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, excuse me, Argentina going over quite dry in the next seven days, uh, which will be good for the harvest of the crop that's nearly done. But the later crop that's finishing, um, we need some more rain on that. So this is not good for that crop. What I meant about interesting was that finally we're seeing precipitation coming through Paraguay here into Mato Grosso do Sol over into uh, Paraná and Rio Grande do Sol, areas that have been exceptionally dry while this section of Brazil begins to dry out a little bit here. So uh, interesting just to see how things are shaping up globally here as we finish one crop in one area and begin crops in the Northern Hemisphere. And with that, we're going to go and wrap it up right here. I hope you all have a great week and I'll talk to you again next Monday. Thank you.